going to work with uh, Ravi Kanan and David in case you uh, didn't get the impression from the, from the last talk. He works on algorithms too. Um, okay, so did I reveal all the um, sorry cloud computing? So uh, yeah, I, I haven't actually computed on a cloud so far, but. Apparently, no, no, actually yeah, I have, right? Every time you do a Google search, aren't you computing <laughs> on, the, on the cloud? So we all, we're all doing it. Um, well, I guess the, the, the main point is that data is distributed on many servers. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is, not a, this is not a new thing. This has been happening for a while. In, uh, you know, in parallel algorithms, uh, computation is distributed, and there the focus is somehow the time, the, the time to complete a task. In streaming algorithms, again, there's so much data that doesn't even fit in memory and not even on, on, on many processors or many servers, but there the focus is sublinear space or memory. Um, and so I guess in cloud, the, or, or with many servers, the, in addition to time and space, you want to the, the, the question is communication. So that's the bottleneck. So I guess the motivation is something like you have all these servers sitting out there, they have the data, pieces of the data, you're computing some function of the entire set of data, and uh, you'd like to compute this function with as little communication as possible. You measure the total amount of communication because that's the bottleneck. You know, each, each bit you're sending is, um, has some latency and you know, there's, a, there's some bandwidth, so it takes up more time. So in any case, it's a, it's a, it's a resource you have to grapple with, right? Um, so this, this sort of consideration was introduced uh, in, this, in a paper by Kormode, Motukushin, and Yi in 2008. And so what we're calling here a nimble algorithm is one that has polynomial time and space, as usual. Um, but, but ideally, it also has sublinear communication. And so the communication time is, uh, is, uh, yeah, is much smaller than the size of the data. So you, you don't want a solution where you're saying, let's just send all the data to server one, compute the answer, and you're done. So we want it sublinear. Somehow you're avoiding that. OK. Um, no, it's a, there's, a, there's actually a natural connection between this sort of uh, uh, model where you have distributed data and you'd like to minimize communication and streaming where data is just coming through in a stream and you want to m keep your memory uh, small, your, your space small. So streaming algorithms, as we saw in, uh, in the first talk today, keep uh, small sketches of data. That's the key thing. In fact, as far as I know, all streaming algorithms are sketching algorithms. Uh, uh, no? Okay. <laughs> okay. So the, the, the ones I know are all sketching algorithms. And they, uh, you know, so you, you can always run a streaming, al a sketching algorithm in the cloud by saying, I'll compute a sketch. Each server computes a sketch of its, um, of its data and passes on the sketch to the second server, computes its sketch of its data, maybe uses the first sketch, and go moves on. Now, maybe they all just compute sketches, share their sketches, and everybody computes the function of all the sketches. So this, this is something you could always do. Um, now, nimble algorithms, the ones that must use little communication, somehow must also compute some kind of summary of the data, since they're not sending the whole data. And there's a question, are they equivalent? Can you actually do things more efficiently? You seem to have more power, because you can, each server can do whatever it wants on its data set. It has all of it in memory um, on its subset of data. So there's a simple observation in a paper by Dom, Phillips, Saha, and Venkata Subramanium that says that the total communication in the cloud is never more than the order of the memory you use in the streaming model, just because you could do this business of uh, passing along the sketches. Yes? Uh, so for now, we're assuming that there's already been an arbitrary partition. A completely arbitrary partition has been made. So data has been collected on these servers by some distributed process. Uh, and it's, 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 it, so we think of it as an arbitrary partition of the data. It might be interesting to consider some more uh, careful partition or random partition, but for, for now we're taking the worst case approach that data has been, you know, customer preferences have been aggregated by servers based on some hard to discern process. No, no, the, the data is already sitting there. So that's collected over time separately, yeah. Okay, um, so is this, so can you do something better or faster than than, than, uh, than in the streaming model. What are the limits? 
So what we, we should talk about a set of problems to think about. So here are problems that I'll touch on this talk. A computing frequency moments. It's a, it's a basic problem for large data sets that comes up a lot and was one of the foundational problems for the streaming model. Counting copies of subgraphs. So uh, you want to count how many triangles or how many C4s. People use this in clustering to, to try to get a sense of uh, how non-random some data might be. Low rank approximation is, uh, uh, or, or computing the top principal components or the subspace of the top k principal components. Clustering. And so those are the ones we'll talk about in, this, uh, in, in the next half an hour. Uh, but you could also talk about other problems. You, know, you want to compute a, an approximate maximum matching in, or uh, a flow or solve a linear program where the constraint matrix has been distributed somehow or the entries of the constraint matrix have been distributed. Um, and these are things where I, I, I don't have anything interesting to say. Um, OK, so uh, for, 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 this, for these first four problems, there are already nice uh, results in streaming. And we more or less know the picture of the upper bound versus lower bound for how much space is needed. Um, so let's go with the first problem, frequency moments. So you're given a vector of frequencies. So these are frequencies of items. And you might not actually have the vector itself. They might just come as updates. So you see a sequence of item i plus 1, item j plus 1, or it could be minus also in the modular model. And uh, these correspond at the end of the day to, if you aggregate them, a uh, set of frequencies. And you'd like to compute the kth norm. I should really put to the power of k on the left there. But the sum of the kth powers of these frequencies, that's what you want to compute. Um, I don't exactly know why you want to compute this beyond k equal to 2, but apparently it's of interest in, uh, in, in databases, and uh, it seems like a, like a nice thing to compute, um, to within small relative error. Now, a foundational result of Alon, Matthias, and Segedi um, showed that um, for k less than equal to 2, you can use a, a small space random projection, limited independence random projection, to compute this to arbitrary accuracy. Okay. No, um, um, uh, now, this was tightened by Indic and Woodruff, and, and there were some papers in between. So now we know that uh, the bound for space in the streaming model is n to the 1 minus 2 over k, and up to log factors, this is both the upper bound and the lower bound. So for k equal to 3, say, you get a polynomial lower bound on the space. So you need uh, n to the 1 third space to be able to, say, get a factor 2 approximation to the, to the to the, to, to the third, third norm. Okay. Um, and, and that gets higher. A closely related problem, well, we'll see why it's related. Counting, counting various things, uh, these already have a quadratic lower bound. You basically need to see almost the entire graph before you can count the number of triangles to within, um, within say, factor of two. OK. Um, now, for low rank approximation, um, what is the problem? You have a matrix, n by d, and uh, you'd like to find uh, another matrix, but of rank at most k or equal to k, so that the, let's say the Frobenius norm is at most 1 plus epsilon times what you'd get if you had the best rank k approximation, which I have denoted as ak here. So there's the best approximation, and you want to be within 1 plus epsilon. So the usual low rank approximation. And for this, uh, Clarkson and uh, Woodruff showed that any streaming algorithm needs uh, linear space, essentially. Well, not quite linear. It's n plus d times k. Right? So uh, if you want to get that approximation, you need uh, this. And there's a divide. By, I'm ignoring the dependence on epsilon. But let's say factor of 2, you need this much space already. OK. OK, so. So for all, the, so I, I haven't said anything about clustering here, but for, for, the, for the first three problems, frequency moments, homomorphisms, and uh, low rank approximation, in streaming, you already have, uh, uh, sorry, uh, um, linear lower bounds, a linear in at least n, the number of items or the number of rows. So um, that's all you would get if you try to apply blindly or, or black box reduction of cloud, of server computation to streaming. So we have to do something different if you want to do better. And first of all, is it even clear that you can do better? So let's look at a lower bound. So the lower bounds for streaming are typically, or, or, or most of them, I won't claim all, are come from this problem called uh, set disjointness or multiplayer set disjointness with t players. And they have subsets of, um, of 1 through n. And the problem is, let's say, to determine whether the sets are all disjoint or all have one element in common. Let's just 
that's one case of this. There are various cases that are interesting. You just want to determine, are they all disjoint, or do they all have one element in common? How many bits do you need to communicate? And so uh, through a series of uh, papers, uh, we know now that uh, you need at least n over, roughly n over t bits. To, to determine this, you need at least n over t bits. OK. Um, so it's a subsets of 1 through n. And to determine if there's one element in common versus none, you already need n over t bits total communication. Now let's look at, uh, so that's the theorem, just the same thing. Let's, now let's take for the case of computing of frequency moments. Uh, um, you know, the sets are, as I said, either disjoint or one element in common. Let's think of each set as being on one server, right? Each subset of 1 through n is on one server. And the function you're trying to compute is 0 if they're all disjoint and 1 if they all have one element in common. Now look at what the kth frequency moment will be. The way we'll do it is we'll just compute the kth frequency moment and see if it's small or large. If they had nothing in common, then the frequency moment would be just sum of 1 to the k, which is n. If they had one element in common, it would be n minus 1 plus that one element would have frequency s, so it's s to the k. Right? So you have a big ratio here between n and n minus 1 plus s to the k. So suppose we have a factor 2 approximation for the kth frequency moment. Then uh, we can set s to the k to be, say, n plus 1. And you're able to distinguish between these two cases. You can solve this problem of uh, telling set disjoinness. So factor 2 approximation uh, can do this. But we know that there's a lower bound of n over t, which is n over s in this case. n is s to the k. That's a lower bound of s to the k minus 1. So if you want to compute the kth frequency moment on s servers, you need at least s to the k minus 1 bits. That just follows from me. But that's all, only s to the k minus 1, not n to the 1 minus 2 over k. Okay? So, it's, so the, in particular, if you had, let's say, the number of servers was not a function of n, the total number of size of the database, this is some constant. Okay? Uh, so what, what can the upper bound be? So what we'll prove here is that the kth frequency moment on s servers you can do using just s to the k over epsilon squared words of communication, where each word is b plus log n, and b is the word length of the, of the input frequencies. Okay? So, so uh, yeah, so compared to the lower bound, this is a factor of s times number of bits used per word higher. Um, previously, uh, Woodruff and Zhang had a bound of uh, s to the k minus 1 times uh, polylog in, uh, uh, I mean, a polynomial in log n over epsilon where the exponent depended on k. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, the streaming complexity lower bound is much higher. Now, the main idea of the algorithm is going to be a very simple algorithm. The idea will be to sample elements according to their powers of their frequencies. Now, we've seen already through yesterday, um, and most of you know that uh, sampling, say, rows of a matrix or elements of a stream according to their squared values um, or according to leverage scores, which is a square on a different basis, uh, is very useful. Here, it'll turn out that you'll need, you'll need higher powers, and it gives you, gives you a lot of um, uh, flexibility. So let's just do a simple, very simple exercise before we do that. There's a simplest case where this is interesting already is when you have two servers and you want to compute the third moment. Okay? So third moment is already hard for streaming, polynomial space hard. So here we have, uh, by that I mean... Uh, you know, it needs polynomial space, not p-space hard. And then you, here you need, uh, uh, let's see what we need. Two servers. And uh, let's say the frequencies on the first server are u1 through un. The frequencies on the second server are v1 through vn. So these are the aggregates of the updates that these servers have received. They're non-negative. And we'd, what we'd like to compute is the sum of ui plus vi cube. Right? That's, that's, what, that's what you want to compute. OK, so let's expand it. Uh, you know, when you expand it, Oh, I should have written down the expansion. There's a ui cube term, which is easy. You do it in one server. vi cube term, that's easy. Do it on the other server. And it's the cross terms you have to worry about. Now, the cross terms look like what? ui squared v, vi and vi squared ui. So we'll do those two separately. Okay? So how are we going to do the sum of um, ui squared vi? That's what we want to do, where, where the u's are on one server, v's are on one other server. Okay, so here's what we'll do. We'll sample an element. The first server will sample an element with probability proportional to its third power. OK? So at least you're computing third moment. It's the third power. It's nothing crazy. And then it announces the, this index, j. 
And then the other server will compute what we want, uj squared vj, but uh, divide by pj, the, this probability. So it announces j and the probability. Okay? And so that will that, compute this number, and we average this over 1 over epsilon squared samples. Now the point is that the expectation of, uh, of this variable that's being computed is exactly what we want, right? Because it's with probability pj, we're computing uj squared times vj. So it's the right, it has the right expectation. The question is, what's the variance? That's a fairly straightforward computation too. So there's the probability. There's the random variable. Now it's only that if it's if if in fact um, uh, we, yeah. And there's the expectation. And for the variance, I'm just literally sub, uh, bounding it by the second moment. Uh, so the sum is only over vi's that are positive. It's the sum of x squared times pi. One pi cancels, and then you get. Uh, um, you know, the pi has the ui cube in the denominator that goes up, and you're left there. The last per step, I just used the inequality that ui vi squared is always smaller than either ui cube or vi cube. So that's it. Straightforward, direct thing. And that's the variance. And this variance is perfectly fine for us because the quantity we are estimating is exactly summation of ui cube plus vi cube. So the standard deviation is of the right order. In fact, you need only one over epsilon squared samples for two servers, third moment. Okay. So that's the total amount of communication. That times log. OK. So now let's do many servers, kth moments. This is the general problem. You have s servers, and you want to compute the kth moment. So that's the expression you want to compute right now. Fij stands for the frequency of the ith element on the jth server. Right? So server can aggregate its updates. Fij is how many times the jth server saw the ith element. Okay. And so the total frequency of the ith element is the inner sum there. We're powering that to k and adding it up over all n elements. That's, that's what you'd like to compute. OK, so now I'm um, uh, just expanding out that, uh, that uh, um, power there. And you get here k choose r1 through rs, which add up to k, so that you, it's the number of powers of how many times you take fi, fi1, how many times you take fi2, and so on. And then you're left with Fij to the Rj, right? So that's just the expansion of, the, of that. And now let's reverse the summations so that we will do one estimation of for each term of this type. So there are at most s to the k terms. That's the s to the k. And now we need to estimate a term of this type, which is what? The sum over all elements of the product of the frequencies to the power of Rj for a fixed set of Rjs, R1, R2, up to some. R, 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 M, or R, what do I call it, S, and you want the product of F, I, J to the R, J summed up over all elements. That's what you want. Okay. Um, so we'll do that separately. So this is the goal now. Fix one of those terms. You want to estimate that. Okay. Now this is a little bit trickier, right? Because, because uh, um, yeah. So the first server. Again, samples an element with probability now proportional to the kth moment. It always picks the kth moment for the uh, so the kth power of the frequency. So that's just all, that's all it is. Look at what it has. Power everybody to the power of k. Pick one according to the kth power. Okay. Now uh, it sends this to to everybody. And now every other server j prime has to uh, is going to make a decision. It either announces the frequency of that element i in, in its set, or it doesn't. And it sends it either, no, this is just breaking ties, um, either if you know, its index is smaller than the index of the server that's sending this element, and its value is smaller. So in, in, in all cases, it only outputs its frequency if, the frequency if its frequency is smaller than the lead for this round of the computation. So server J is leading this round. We're going to do this for every server. Server J is leading this round. So in that term, server J is going to be responsible for all terms in which Fij is the highest. Okay? All i's where Fij is highest. So everybody else, once they know Fij, they know whether they're higher or lower. And they only announce themselves if they're lower. And this business of J prime less than J and J prime greater than J with less than equal to is just to break ties so that we don't have people sending it both ways. You could do that in a couple of ways. OK, once you've done that, now uh, server J, which was leading this computation, has all the frequencies for the index i. 
and it, uh, est it knows the powers rj. That, that's, that, that's what this whole routine is doing right now. And it estimates the correct term divided by the probability with which you would have come up with that term. OK. So again, so this is the entire algorithm again for that term. So the expectation is correct by design. I mean, we divided by pi, so the expectation is correct. But the variance is once again small. It's at most um, basically the quantity we're computing. OK, so this takes a little bit more computation, but also is straightforward. Um, um, so, uh, and then the, 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 so therefore, to estimate one term, you only, again need only 1 over epsilon squared samples. The total number of terms is s to the k at most. So the computation time is s to the k over epsilon squared. So it's a very simple algorithm. You, the only new trick or element is that you need to sample according to a higher power of the frequency. Okay. And you achieve nearly optimal communication. So the next problem, uh, closely related to this, is uh, counting um, copies of a graph, one graph and another. So we think of the graph H as a fixed graph, something of fixed size. And you want to know how many copies of this are there in some big graph G. Now, the big graph G is distributed. It's all over the place. It's, you know, some vertices are in this server, some vertices in this server, and so on. And nevertheless, you would like to figure out how many copies. So for example, some interesting cases that have come up in various applications are number of triangles, number of four cycles, you know, number of uh, complete bipartite, say, R by R subgraphs, and so on. Uh, and there are linear lower bounds for, for all these things in the streaming model. Um, now, even in the cloud model, uh, you get lower bounds of omega n, say, for counting triangles or counting four cycles. So even in this model, here you can't beat sublinear in n if it's a graph with n vertices, and that's using the same uh, multi-party set this joinness lower bound. So I won't go over that, but lower bound of n is impossible to avoid if we assume an arbitrary partition of the edges of the graph. If the edges have been partitioned arbitrarily, then, then you can't avoid this one, lower bound. But what we'll do instead is suppose we assume a partition of the vertices, which is arguably natural for many applications, that uh, the, the vertices of the graph, so everybody has the adjacency list of w some vertices of the graph. Which vertices? That's arbitrary. But it's, you get the entire row of the adjacency matrix. Under this setting, you can do some things. So for example, suppose you wanted to count the number of paths of length 2, where the graph has degrees d1 through dn. So this is one way to write number of homomorphisms. The number of copies of k12, that's the graph path of length 2, in the graph g is just uh, the summation of di choose 2, because the center vertex is i. It has to pick two of its neighbors. That's the path of length 2. That's di choose 2, and you're adding it up over all i vertices. Now, that's just a polynomial, right? It's the uh, second frequency moment minus the first you know, summation of di you get in terms of di squared and di, both of which we can estimate. In fact, you could have done this in, in the streaming model also, because uh, these are just second moments. But now it will get interesting if we go consider a graph which has a bigger power, polynomial with a bigger power. So let's suppose I consider the number of stars, 1r, so star with r leaves. Then this is just summation of di choose r, and that we can now do just simply by using the frequency counting algorithm from the previous, uh, from, the, from the earlier part of, from, from that I just described. Um, number of C4s, well, for the number of C4s, um, so number of four cycles, right? We pick two vertices, and let's define dij as the number of common neighbors of a pair of vertices. And then the number of C4s is uh, dij choose 2. Because uh, you, you have to pick two pairs of common neighbors, a, a pair of common neighbors. And similarly, if you want to do complete subgraphs of, with A cross B, you can do that as define the common degree of a subset of vertices, ds. For a subset of vertices, ds is the number of vertices they have, all have as a common neighbor. And that choose uh, B gives you the number of uh, uh, um, bipartite graphs A cross B. So um, there is no new algorithm here. It's just saying that when you have a partition of rows in the cloud model, you can just use frequency moments to count number of copies of a subgraph. OK. So next I'll go to, yes. Uh, no, there are many graphs, which, so, so I didn't put triangles here noticeably. And uh, for triangles, sorry? 
um, path of length 3, I don't know actually, yeah, no, no, it's good. Um, there is a class of graphs we can do, the theorem is in the paper, where you, if all the degrees of the vertices come from a fixed subset of possible degree numbers, that's what we can do. Um, but it's not like saying vertex 1 has this degree and vertex 2, each vertex can have any one of these degrees. Count all graphs with this property, that's what you can deduce directly. Maybe, but th there could very well be some other more uh, thoughtful algorithm. Yeah. Um, okay, any other questions? So next we'll go to low rank approximation um, or approximating the top K uh, SVD subspace. So that's the problem again. But now uh, the data, right? The matrix A is your data. That's the full data set. And it's been partitioned among the servers as matrices. So the, the entries, I mean, they just add up to the right matrix. It could be that each one, you have some subset of the entries, or even each entry has been split up somehow. It doesn't matter. The whole point, the, all you want to do is compute a function of the sum of the matrices that have been stored on separate servers. Okay? So maybe these are um, these user recommendations or likes or something, and each server is collecting some things, and you want to compute one function of the entire, entire uh, matrix. Uh, yeah, so it's an n by d matrix. Now, um, now it seems like you, you need linear communication because your answer is of size, uh, you know, you're computing a matrix at the end of the day, and you want that matrix to sit somewhere. Um, uh, it seems that you'd, you'd need some kind of linear communication if you want to really output that matrix. So what we'll say instead is that this matrix itself will be partitioned among the, the servers. Okay? So each server, it has A1, it will compute A1 tilde. It has A2, it will compute A2 tilde. With the property that the sum of the AIs is of course the original data A, the sum of the AI tildes will be rank K and a good approximation to A. Okay? So each one will get a good approximation uh, to its part of the data, but good approximation in the sense that it's actually a good approximation to the whole matrix. Okay? It could have computed grand K approximation to its own data without any communication. Yes? AK is the best rank K approximation. Sorry. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> Terrible, yeah. In case that prevents you from paying further attention. <laughs> um, uh, let's call it, um, okay. Right, okay. So that's the best rank K approximation. And uh, yeah, so we want to find, place this locally. So now at least there, is no, there isn't the trivial lower bound where you, where you say, oh, look, you had even communicating the answer would have taken this, time, this much time. In principle, it might need very little communication. So that's the problem. How do we compute these approximate matrices inside each one so that their sum is a true, truly good rank K approximation? OK, uh, now we're thinking, so this is the theorem that uh, you can actually do it for an n by d matrix with total com communication that's only S, K, D. S is the number of servers, K is the rank, and D is the sh shorter dimension. Okay? So if it's an N by D matrix, you'll need S, K, D. But it's an arbitrary partition, not a row partition. We're back to arbitrary partition of the data. Okay? And um, um, it seems that S, K, D might be a lower bound, but we, we haven't um, pinned that down completely. Uh, SKD might actually be a lower bound even in the cloud model. Okay. Um, okay, so I'll build up to this. Um, I'll, I won't quite prove the entire thing, but, but uh, almost. Um, so to warm up, just to warm up, suppose we actually have a row partition, right? So each of these AIs, A1, A2, and so on, is a subset of rows. And you'd like to um, uh, uh, do the, solve the same problem find uh, a tilde so that they are a good low rank approximation. So then it's easy, right? So what you do is, uh, you know, you, ha you have a subset of rows, so you compute 
uh, think of it as a full matrix, even though you only have a few non-zero rows. Compute uh, AJ transpose AJ. This is now just a D by D matrix, right? Remember, A is N by D. Each AI is potentially N by D. So A transpose is D by N. A transpose A or AJ transpose AJ is only D by D. So everybody computes their AJ transpose AJ, sends it to one server. OK? And that server adds it up and announces the top k eigenvectors of this, of this matrix. So the total communication we're using is s times d squared, because everybody's sending a d squared matrix, right? d by d matrix. And you add it up. Now each server computes the, can compute simply the best. Uh, so you, so you, you've announced v, top k eigenvectors of v. Send that back to, I mean, announce it to all of the servers. The top k eigenvectors of b are just d by k. Right, they're k eigenvectors. Each of them is a d vector, so it's dk or sdk. And now each server computes its pro the projection of its subset of data onto this the, these k vectors. That's all. This vv transpose all it's doing is project a onto the span of v and represent it in in the basis v. Right? So um, that's it. So this is not only a pro uh, this is just optimal. This is the, this is finding the exact right answer. Why? Because uh, you know, the span of, I mean, what is B? B is just A, A transpose, or A transpose A. And you're finding the top K eigenvectors of A transpose A, which is exactly what SVD should do. So this is just an exact algorithm. So getting SD squared communication in the row partition model is not hard at all, because you could just, uh, since you have complete rows. OK. But now let's do it with an arbitrary partition. Now, to do this with arbitrary partitions, the main tool is uh, limited independence random projection, just as in uh, people use in the streaming models, some very uh, useful tool there. Um, it, 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 it gets you um, things that are impossible in streaming over here. So one notion that's useful is that a matrix P, which will be the projection matrix, um, uh, there exists the, these matrices of size D over epsilon square times N, so that if I consider any vector, so now this is not a for each, but it's for all, uh, vector x in R to the d, the norm, the two norm of P A x is uh, approximately, I mean, the two norm of A x is approximately preserved even after when you apply P. The advantage is that P A is much smaller, right? A was n by d, P times A is only d over epsilon squared by d. Okay? So the idea will be, let's just first uh, uh, project and then uh, use the previous algorithm of compute for computing the SVD on uh, the projected matrices. Okay? So all we have to do is agree on a projection, which we'll do exactly as in the streaming model. You pass along a seed to everybody, and the communication is going to depend on the seed length. Now, the seed for this, this kind of matrix depends on how much independence you need. You only need d-wise independence, so the seed length is d squared. In fact, you'll need even less the d, d squared. So you pass along a d squared length seed. Everybody computes a projection matrix locally, projects their subset of rows onto that, sends that all to one matrix, which then can compute the SVD or the rank K subspace, sends it back. So um, here it is. Agree on a projection matrix P via random seed. Each server computes P A T, sends to server one. A T is their subset of the matrix. It's an arbitrary row partition though now, right? I mean, arbitrary partition. Uh, each server, uh, and then server one computes the total of all of these, so it's got PA. Server one has managed to get the projection of the entire matrix. Now, uh, it can compute the top K singular vectors of this and uh, projects uh, and announces them. And once it announces them, everybody can do their own projection onto this subspace. So that's the whole algorithm. And now, for this, the communication is same as before, SD squared over epsilon squared and we get a 1 plus epsilon approximation. So we'll see why, why, why should this be a good approximation. So we're saying if you replace the matrix A by PA, then the best rank K approximation for PA is still a good rank K approximation for A. That's the only thing I have to prove. Okay? After that, it's done, because everything else is saying that PA can be computed efficiently in the cloud. Okay. So why is the best rank K approximation for PA a good approximation for uh, the rank a good rank approximation for A. So that, that, that's just the, the, the same algorithm. I put it up there, and here is the proof. So we want to show that, um, now remember, V is this best rank K vectors calculated for PA. That's what the algorithm calculates. 
So the error of the projection calculated by the algorithm is at most 1 plus order epsilon times the best possible. Oh, Amit, uh, you'll uh, let this one pass or close your eyes. Yeah, OK. Uh, that, that's supposed to be opt there. OK, maybe I can't. Uh, and now to be, I guess I have to be consistent. OK. Um, OK, so that's the best rank approximation there. It's going to show up again. Yeah. So extend, so, so here's the proof. It's just two lines. This is the, sort of the first proof you would do. Extend v to a basis. You know, v, remember, is only the first uh, k uh, vectors, right? It's the best rank k approximation of PA. So it's k, k orthogonal vectors. Extend it to a basis v1 through vd. Now look at this error. Well, the error of a matrix upon projection to a subspace as defined by an orthogonal matrix V is the, is the projection onto its, uh, its, its orthogonal subspace. So it's sum over k plus 1 through d of AVI squared. Now by the property of the random projection, each length AVI is preserved to within 1 plus epsilon. And so this is within 1 plus epsilon squared of the error, not the error, the, the, the total norm of the projection of PA onto, onto these vectors. OK, so that's one part. This is just saying that the error you got is, in fact, at most 1 plus epsilon times the, the error of, the, of PA, of, what, of, of the optimal value of the projected matrix. Now we need to make sure that that value there is, is, is comparable to the best possible for the original matrix. So that's the second line. So forget about the 1 plus epsilon squared here, there. So this is the total uh, norm of PA when projected orthogonal to the subspace we found. Well, it's at most what it would be if you project, instead of projecting it to, to the vectors v1 through vk, suppose we project to the optimal vectors u1 through uk, which are the SVD vectors of the matrix A, which we don't know. Then that error can only be higher. And um, yeah, because v is optimal for PA. And then uh, again, we use the property that PA approximately preserves norms within 1 plus epsilon. So now you can go back to A there. And now A, the projection of A onto U is the optimal uh, value by, by assumption. So that's, that's the A minus AK there. And we get uh, a 1 plus epsilon to the 4, which is 1 plus order epsilon. OK. So, yeah, V is the top K singular vectors of PA. Ah, so the property of P is that it's preserved for every length, every, for, yeah, for the entire, it's a subspace embedding. It's preserved for the, that's why we need the D still in the picture, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so uh, now this last step, I won't tell you the details. But we, it was SD squared. I promised you S, uh, SDK. And for that, we need to uh, do one more thing, which is that instead of working with an N by D matrix, the problem with working with an N by D matrix is there is still this N up here. So what we'll do first is apply a subspace embedding so that we preserve the row space of the matrix. So here's the algorithm. We agree on a K over epsilon by N matrix S and a k over epsilon squared by n matrix P, ignoring log factors. Each server computes SAT, so, so it's now taking your data and pro projecting it you know, using this embedding S so that you now are left with only a k over epsilon by D matrix on each server. And you add it up. And now for this space, SA, for this matrix SA, we'll compute an orthonormal basis of, of its rows. Okay? And send that over to everybody so that, now remember, this, 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 this SA is only k over epsilon by D. So the orthonormal basis will have length only k, it only has k over epsilon vectors. So now we project A to this basis. So A instead of n by D becomes n by k over epsilon, n, n by k over epsilon, and then apply the previous algorithm. Once you've got an n by k over epsilon matrix, you can apply the previous algorithm, which take, took time uh, 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 SD squared. The point is that by applying the subspace projection up front, we don't lose uh, the best, the quality of the, be the, the best rank K approximation for this subspace is, 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 is within 1 plus epsilon of the optimum. The best rank K approximation after we apply the projection later is within 1 plus epsilon. 
Now, naively, you might think, okay, you have two different one plus epsilons. You're going to get two plus order epsilon if you commit both errors. But it turns out that these projections are orthogonal, and so we'll be able to actually keep it to just one plus epsilon overall, even though you're doing two, two of these projections together. Okay, the last thing, which I'll just summarize, is um, clustering, and by that I really mean just k-means clustering. Um, um, as we saw in uh, 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 the talk before the break, uh, talk, there, this is one of the things that comes up where you're computing centers, and you'd like to find a clustering that minimizes the distances to centers. Now, one thing to note is that uh, an approximately optimal solution for this problem can be very different from an optimal solution in terms of how it actually arranges data. And uh, so one thing we cannot do is just project the data to preserve distances to a low dimensional space and then cluster and then optimize this function. That just doesn't work. On the other hand, uh, Kanan and Kumar came up with this condition that said that suppose you assume that every pair of cluster centers are order k standard deviations apart. Okay, so there is some structure on the data where the centers are somewhat far apart. And what is the standard deviation? Well, the variance is the maximum over all one dimensional projections of the average square distance of a point to its center. Now, this, this actually makes sense in many contexts. In particular, for Gaussian mixtures, this is just the maximum directional variance. And what they showed is that if you have a data set for which uh, you know, the optimum satisfies this condition, then you can find it. And the algorithm is do an SVD, compute an approximately optimal set of k centers, and then run the k-means algorithm. You actually run the k-means iteration, and that will give you uh, a set of centers that are very close to the optimal ones, close enough that the clustering itself agrees on almost all of the points. Okay, so um, uh, all I'm going to say here is that you can do this in the cloud if you assume a row partition of the data. And the extra step we need besides the uh, rank k projection, which I just covered, is being able to start with a good set of centers. And for that, uh, we use the result of Chen, which says that indeed to, com to, to compute an approximate good of centers, or to compute the value of a set of centers, you don't need to worry about the entire data set. There's a core set of small size, which you can use, uh, who, who, which approximates the value for every subset of centers. And this core set can be found in a nimble way with low, little communication. So at the end of the day, you can do k-means clustering in the cloud and achieve the same guarantee that they get in their paper under these conditions uh, with only d squared plus k to the 4 communication. I'm not showing the dependence on s, but it's a polynomial in s uh, for s equals order 1 servers. So this is the last thing. So I mean, um, I guess the natural questions are, can you solve linear programs, flow and matching? What is the communication complexity of all of these things? You can ask this for any question in NP. What's the communication complexity in the cloud of, for solving these things? Um, or what properties can you estimate efficiently? And then maybe um, and there has been work. I mentioned some. There are other papers which uh, have looked at distributed learning. A random partition of data might be interesting. And maybe you can do much more with a random partition of data. Uh, I don't know. Uh, a uh, good result to tell you, but it's possible and it's also reasonable. Um, and perhaps there's a connection to property testing. It's just a tentative question at this point where uh, these parameters can be related. So I'll stop here. Thanks. So it's sublinear in m times n, right? Sublinear in the entire. Yeah. Error. Approximate solutions. So for example, I don't know how to count triangles accurately, even if you have a random partition. Yeah, yeah so it could help because it's like a sample. Yeah, right. Thanks.
For, for what? Yes, that's in streaming, in the streaming model. Uh, counting triangles, uh, it's the, yeah, so it's there in Muthu's notes, but also I think Amit's notes, where uh, um, you, can, you build this uh, tripartite graph, right, where you have a, not arbitrary cross subgraphs, the specific ones that I pointed out. So you can extend this lower bound for, uh, for triangles, C4s, KRRs, so some, including some for which we have the upper bound. That's, that was the, the point. There's a lower bound, you mean? Oh, great. OK. Yeah. So if you want to find the upper, estimate, estimate the size of the matching to within 1 plus epsilon or factor 2 or something. Factor 2 is easy. Uh, Matching itself. But to output the matching, that's already a linear number of edges, right? Yeah. I think there is a, going to be a talk by Sudipto where he shows how to do matchings uh, nicely, with, but, but linear in N, not still linear in N. Yeah. Thanks.